Hello, hello, I'm Zachary Hines, and this is what you missed at the Straz. Hello, I am Zachary Hines, and I am here with the, the great, intelligent, wise <laughs> Leanne Day Douglas. Oh, hello. How are you? I am fabulous. You know, I'm getting I'm getting accustomed to this quarantine life. You know, I think I finally got my workstation comfortable. Oh yeah. Viewers, you can't see. We we zoom as we podcast so that we can see each other. Mm -hmm. Um and Leanne has upgraded her whole look right now. She is now rocking a full on Madonna mic. That's right. I feel like it's really just for me because we all know that Madonna is my icon. Yeah, it's not actually a Madonna mic. These are gaming headphones. So I needed headphones that, number one, were more comfortable, although it's questionable with these right now, and um, and had a better microphone for podcasting. So this is what I ended up with. You say gaming headphones, I say Madonna mic. <laughs> I love it. So uh, we watched... Pipeline from Lincoln Center Live, which is streaming on our beloved Broadway HD. That's right. And Pipeline is a straight play by Dominique Morceau. We need to get development on this to get Broadway HD to sponsor us because we've really been pimping them out. Yes, absolutely. I want something here from Broadway HD. They need to they need to purchase the Madonna mic. I need to be reimbursed for the Madonna mic from Broadway HD. Yeah. At least give me like a free subscription or something. Right. I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll even take it if just one of us gets a free subscription. That would be great. Come on, Broadway HD. Help a poor arts marketer out. <laughs> Help us out. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Pipeline is a very serious play. But presented in a very real way. There's actually a lot of comedy in it as well. Yeah, I mean, it was, but it was serious. I mean, I, I'm more of a um, art for entertainment kind of gal. Um, I love the just escapism of a good, unrealistic Broadway musical. Um, and that's usually what I'll go for. And you're kind of the opposite. Yeah, I mean, a great tap number is not going to change your thoughts on the school to prison pipeline. Right. But <laughs> but pipeline certainly will give you lots of food for thought. Um and you know, I used to be I used to be hardcore, we've talked about this. I used to be hardcore Broadway musicals. And my best friend's mom, one day we went into the city for my birthday and I wanted to see a musical and she was like, you know what? Maybe you should open your horizons and see a play. And I huff and puffed about it, but we did it and we saw doubt and I loved it. And then I went full tilt into straight play theater. And, and then I kind of poo pooed all of the musicals because I thought, oh, they weren't serious enough. They're not, they don't have enough to say. And I think it's really now kind of found a nice balance where there's space for it all. There's space for the... I just want to be entertained. I want to escape. And there's space for, I want to be challenged. I want to think, you know, theater is a safe space to really push you beyond your boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, Get you out of your comfort zone. I do think Pipeline is entertaining and plays like Pipeline. It was enjoyable. Just like when you go to see a movie that might tackle some heavier subjects it still can be entertaining. So I think, you know, sometimes people have this idea that just because it's talking about real thing means it's not going to be entertaining. And it was entertaining. And the acting was phenomenal. So so let's tell everybody what it's about. I'm, I'm just going to read the, the description. Naya, she's an inner city public high school teacher committed to her students, but desperate to give her only son Omari opportunities that he'll never have. Um. He ends up basically getting he he pushes his teacher into the 
blackboard. Well, it's not a blackboard. It's a multimedia board in this uh, in this play. And he's about to be expelled, basically. So she has to confront his rage. She also has to confront her own choices as a parent. And um, it's about race and anger and privilege. And it's a very serious play. Yes, yes. It definitely tackles... I mean, it starts off with our lead character, Naya, our protagonist, leaving a voicemail for her ex-husband about how her their son is in trouble. And this is the third strike. Um, and, you know, there throughout the play, there's this contrast of rage and anxiety. You know, the mm-hmm. rage of the child and the younger generation wanting to come into their own, but fighting against low expectations and prejudice and all these preconceptions and the anxiety of the mother who knows what their child is up against. And I thought it was really interesting when they were having the conversation about the incident, when he was talking about that he didn't like, he wasn't, he was wanting to leave. And she was like, well, did you, to think of, you know, the people, When thinking of privilege, you know, thinking of my own experience, I don't have to necessarily think about how people are going to perceive what I say or what I do and how that can be dangerous. I mean, even thinking of like recent events with Ahmad Arbery, and I have never in my life had to think that going for a run could mean the end of my life. Right. And you know, so the mom knows this when she's talking to her son and and is saying, you know, she knows how things can be interpreted and and to think of all these filters that um, people must have to put every word and action through before they speak or act uh, just to get by is really um, enraging. It's stunning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I um I didn't realize that I had blinders on about race until there was an incident. I went to school at uh, Florida State University, and I had a friend. Um, she was a black friend, and she and I went shopping, and I was just looking for an alarm clock. And I'll never forget this. And there was an alarm clock on the shelf at, I think we were like at Eckerd's, if this tells you how long ago this was. So we were at Eckerd's and I saw an alarm clock that I wanted and it was on the shelf, but there was nothing like there wasn't a matching one in a box on the shelf beneath or anything behind it. So I wanted to know if I could um, buy the one that was on the shelf. And so I said to her, hey, would you go ask the, the clerk over there if we can buy the one on the shelf? And she went to the clerk and she stood there and she stood there and she stood there and the clerk ignored her and ignored her and ignored her. And there was nobody else around. And finally I went up to the clerk and said, my friend has been trying to find out for me if we can buy the one. And as soon as I walked up, she like straightened up, looked at me, started talking to me. And I was like, Oh my God, she wouldn't even talk to her just because she was black. And that's when the blinders came off for me. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. So when I was researching the play and the playwright, I stumbled over this quote from the playwright, Dominique Morceau, that really struck me. And she says, we think about rage as being criminal. There's such a thing as righteous rage. I think we never talk about rage that is earned and deserves to be expressed. And that really struck me. I feel like the character of Omari has this righteous rage. And, you know, you see that in the Black Lives Matter movement. You see that in that that there needs to be space for that because, you know, these these situations, this kind of oppression is rage invoking. Well, in the play... I mean, Omari was sitting in his English class and they were discussing a particular piece of literature and he was having a bad day. 
and he had told his teacher, don't call on me. I'm not feeling it today. And the t- this particular piece of literature was very, he was drawing, he felt like the teacher was looking at him and saying that this piece of literature was about him. What did this character, what caused this character to lose it? What caused this character to become like an animal and attack this other person? Why is this person an animal? Omari, why? Why do you think? And he's like, don't call on me. And he's like, why, Omari? Why? And he felt like he was saying, you should be able to relate to this because you're a black kid. So what Mm -hmm. would make you lose your (laughs) Can I say that? We'll bleep it. (laughs) Um, So what will make you lose your Omari? And he does lose his and pushes the teacher and uh, leaves the classroom. And that's what gets him in trouble. But he's got all of this rage over his father, his father not being a part of his life. And that's what kind of set him off to begin with that day. And then his teacher's picking on him and calling him an animal. And he's feeling all of these other racial things that are happening underneath the surface. And, um, and it just pushes him to the brink. And after he tells his father, this is why I lost my shit, You're kind of mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, I would have lost it, too. You had every exactly, right. Exactly, yeah. You had mm-hmm. every right to lose it. Absolutely. So, yes, there is room for righteous rage. Absolutely, there needs to be room for it. Yeah, and I think we all need to share in that and, and hopefully take some of the burden off. Um, I think everyone should be enraged by that. You know, the more, the more you dehumanize someone, the more it makes it easier for others to treat them like they're not human. And it makes it easier for them to not believe in their own humanity too. And that is really, I think the worst thing you could do to someone is strip them of their humanity. Um, And rage is part of that, of the human experience. Um, And this is definitely something that warrants that kind of reaction. And I think that's why I love theater like this so much, because I think oftentimes people, you know, if you're, if you are in a privileged situation, unless you have an experience like that, um, where you witness it firsthand, theater provides and storytelling provides an opportunity to show you the experiences of others who are not like you. Mm -hmm. Um, And it shows you, it reflects back your differences and your similarities and it allows you, it really does teach empathy um, because it adds that emotional connection. Um, So I love that because I think, it's really what can help move people and and make a difference um, without feeling like they are being lectured to at or are watching a news report. They're actually kind of wrapped up in the emotional storytelling of the play. Right, right. So a little bit about the playwright. I think she is pretty incredible. Um, she won the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant in 2018. So that was about a year or two after Pipeline. Um, She's from Detroit, Michigan. She wrote, she has a series, uh, a trilogy uh, called The Detroit Project, which are some of the most produced plays in the country. She's actually one of the top 20 produced playwrights in the country currently. Um, And American Stage actually just recently produced Pipeline. And before that, I believe the season before produced her play Skeleton Crew. Um, So she's a really incredible playwright and storyteller. Um, And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on, so throughout the play, she interweaves this poem Mm -hmm. and it's repeated multiple times and performed in different ways. Um, All by Omari, yeah, the son, um, and it's kind of almost like haunting the mother. Yeah, it is haunting the mother. So it's uh, "We Real Cool" by Gwendolyn Brooks, and um, this is actually a poem that I studied in college. 
Um, she's an African American author, Gwendolyn Brooks is, and and the way that it's written, it's I'm I'm just going to read you the poem. It's we real cool, and then what happened in modern interpretations is they changed the breaths. So the Caucasians changed it to be we real cool, we left school, we lurk late, we strike straight, we sing sin, we thin gin. We jazz June, we die soon, which is not how it was written. It was written with the inflection as we real cool we, left school we, lurk late we, strike straight we, sing sin we, thin gin we, jazz June we, die soon. And so that's the way it's read in the play. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's the way it's punctuated grammatically, if you actually see it on the page. Um, And the last line, we die soon, haunts Omari's mother throughout the play. And it's really interesting because there there was this multimedia aspect to the play. Um, It was performed in the round and the back wall was like just a concrete block wall just like you'd see in any kind of school gymnasium um, or anything like that and so they were playing film of inner city school life on the wall in between scenes and uh, it was black and white film and a lot of it was of the kids fighting Um, so it kind of set the scene for just what the emotional impact should be Um, of that scene and they had this blackboard uh, because it's in a school they have a blackboard and the first time that she teaches the poem because she teaches a teacher at the school it the poem writes itself on the blackboard Um, it had to be some kind of projection and at the end of it the end of that scene the poem erases itself and becomes just this blur of chalk on the blackboard which i thought was just super cool um but after she teaches the poem in her class omari is haunting her keeps saying we die soon we die soon and um she has this speech where she's talking about you know i i every time he goes for a walk or goes to the store or goes for a run or um, goes out with his girlfriend or does this or does that or does the other, I have to worry about, is he going to come back alive? And her anxiety over this was just insurmountable. She ends up having a nervous breakdown mm-hmm. in the middle of the play. And I just found it really interesting that they incorporated that poem into the play and how they incorporated it. Um, especially as being someone who had studied that poem at school. Um, it was really interesting to see it that way. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think um, it was really interesting how it, it seemed like each time he presented it or performed it, it was like the last time he did it, he was like gasping for air mm-hmm. between each line. And it was almost like he was suffocating. Right. And it's almost, so it kind of, the first reading was very kind of regular. And so it kind of felt like the stakes kept getting higher and higher with her her anxiety as it was going and growing throughout the play. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really a way to kind of peek inside her mind. I I loved how the playwright used that. And I, I don't know if it was the playwright or the director, but I thought the multimedia interludes of showing the clips of students fighting and being arrested was really inter- was an interesting choice because it kind of connected this individual story to the larger picture of that this is real, this is happening, this is something that goes beyond just this one story. This is many people's story. So I thought that was a really interesting device uh, because it's very simply staged. It's not, you know, a huge spectacle by any means. They base all the set is 
basically just what's needed. Um, so the multimedia aspect, I thought, really kind of added some interesting depth to the production. Yeah, and I love the way that they filmed it because you could actually see the audience in portions of it, um, which showed you how intimate it was. I love when she starts her first lecture and she says, good morning, class, and the entire audience said, good morning. Yes, I love that too. And she seemed surprised, didn't she? Um, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it was it was great. Um, and it was nice at certain parts where she was um, where she would have a soliloquy to see their reactions to what she was saying. Um, so that was an interesting uh, perspective to get to see what the actor sees. Um, I liked that a lot. And they didn't do it mm-hmm. a lot, but just a few times. And it seemed even more intimate than the Schimberg, if that's even possible. Right. You know? mm-hmm. So, um, and it was one of those kind of where they moved set pieces in and out. It was the actors moving the set pieces in and out, um, in between scenes when it's dark. I always wonder how they don't run into each other, but yeah. And so, and it was really, really simple. So, um, you know, the playwright, she's also a teacher and it is interesting that kind of sets the audience up to be like we are in Naya's class. Mm-hmm. Like we are we are students and this is a lesson. But she also sets us up as if we are also teachers because there are scenes um, in the teacher's break room where she is having lunch with a fellow teacher and with the security guard. And so you get to be a part of that conversation as well. Um, So it kind of draws you in. You know, if I had thought of it, I would have asked my mom to watch it and had her on here because she was a teacher for 30 years and she probably would have had a lot of really interesting things to say. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I also think it's interesting the inclusion of the supporting characters because, the I mean, the main storyline centers around the mother and her son, but... There's a really interesting plot with her coworker, her colleague, um, and also with Omari's girlfriend, Jasmine. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just further kind of enriched the world and, and added more depth to the world. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed those scenes. I think they probably could have done without them, um, but it did give you more context for what the public school system, or at least at this particular school, was like. Because the colleague, when she first comes in, she's got uh, butterfly stitches on her cheek, and and she basically had reconstructive surgery because a student, you know, beat her up. And uh, this is her first day back. And um, she's really coarse and gritty and tough. And um, you can tell that she has been around the block and she has no fear and she's just going to get back to work and do what she does. And um, near the end, there's another fight in her classroom and uh, she can't get a hold of the security guard. And she ends up breaking up the fight with a broom and she's now in trouble and might lose her job because of that. Um, Mm -hmm. And the only other choice was to allow the students to fight and perhaps kill each other because one of the students was slamming the other student's head repeatedly into the floor. And so when you're a teacher and you don't have the support you need and these things are happening in your classroom, and as she was saying, how was I supposed to break them apart without the broom? They all are heavily muscled. With zero body fat. (laughs) Yeah, they have zero body fat. They weight lift all the time. And I'm just this little white lady. I can't do this so what did you expect of me you know right she yeah she's she's past middle age she you know um and i there were i loved her storyline i loved the scene the standoff between the mother and the girlfriend Mm -hmm. and i thought that was such and it was like this psychological warfare of the mom because she's go she visits the school she's trying to find her son and the girlfriend was just on the phone with her her friend talking about how she's going to pack up and go f- escape with with Omari and the mom is trying to get information out of the girlfriend and she's trying to protect him or not betray him by 
giving up her where she thinks he is, but the mom is kind of slowly trying to chip away at her, but she kind of also. Yeah. And I love it when she said to Omari's mom, you're not the only one who loves him Mm -hmm. and just kind of, you're not the only one who cares about how this turns out. I care about him too. So stop acting like you're the only one who's got, who's invested in this. You know, I'm invested in this as well. So I understand you think you have his best interests at heart, but I do too. So I I found it really interesting. And and it was interesting, all of the people who had Omari's best interests at heart, right? His girlfriend had opinions on what he should do. His mother had opinions. His father had opinions. And, um, And he's almost a man. I mean, he's old enough to be close to manhood. Mm -hmm. And they should also listen to his opinions about what should happen. Right. Well, finally, I think because the play ends with, you know, there's this big scene pretty much in the middle when the mom is home and he he eventually comes home and um, she begs him to tell her what he needs because she's realizing she made all these decisions because she thought that was what was right. She, it's what the father said, you know, I live in a better neighborhood. We can give him a better life if you send him here. Um, And so she made all these decisions really without consulting him. You know, sometimes, you know, a parent always wants the best for their kid, but she eventually is like, just tell, give me the instructions for loving you. And eventually at the end, he tells her, um, so it's kind of a nice, hopeful journey. That's really interesting. I didn't think of that until you just said that, that, you know, we also need to give people the space to tell us what they need, mm-hmm. to tell us how to love them. And one other little side note, I love when Jasmine, the girlfriend, said every relationship deserves to go through every color of the rainbow, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which I loved because she was kind of sad about how her relationship with him was cut short because he had to leave school. And I thought that was just a beautiful way. There were just so many little beautiful moments in in the story that also just kind of struck me. And I think that's why I love those little supporting characters, even though they don't kind of plug directly into the main storyline. So I think that was great. Um, thank you for watching that. and going out of uh, your tap dance comfort zone. I know. No tap dance for me. There is no tap. Spoiler alert. There is no tap dance breaks in Pipeline. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we'll remount to production. Maybe. And add a tap dance encore. There you go. So next week, we're going to be watching one of our faves. I think we can both agree. Audra McDonald is the greatest of all time. She really is. And she is in Lady Day at Emerson's Bar and Grill, which is now streaming on our beloved Broadway HD, (laughs) our unofficial sponsor. Come on, Broadway HD, give us some love. (laughs) Tell us how to love you. (laughs) But we're going to be watching that and we'll be talking about it next week. Until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other. And we'll catch you later. 